So I guess we are now uh, online. Uh, welcome to the next session of our conference. Uh, I am, uh, let me see, everything is fine. I hope. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm Ernst Schaube from Roskilde University and the moderator of this session. It is my great pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker, Wade Pickering. Wade Pickering is a retired professor of psychology and an outstanding historian of psychology. The body of his work centers on the history of psychology. However, he is connecting historical thinking with the crisis of today and reflects how psychology could contribute to a viable future on planet Earth. His most recent books include Psycholo Psychology and Health, Culture, Place, History, just published a few, a few weeks ago. And last year, he published the co-edited Handbook of the Intellectual History of Psychology with Cambridge University Press. Building on historical, contextual, and eco-psychological thinking, he's engaged in developing a pluriversal approach to psychological inquiry in times of ecological crisis. The title of his talk is Psychology's Otherwise, a Decolonial Option for Our Present Crisis. Wait, thanks for joining in. We are looking forward to your talk. Oh, oh, thank you, Ernst. <clears throat> I'm really happy to be here. Um, welcome to all who uh, view, uh, participate today and those who will uh, uh, watch this later. Really, uh, really pleased to be part of this online conference. I thank the, the organizers. And uh, I want to um, uh, uh, let's see here. And I want to also, as I begin to, get, to give the talk, I want to thank my son, Graham, um, who is teaching and research is in human geography, especially as it relates to the environment. And he's informed me so much and shaped, shaped my thinking so much about this. I want to, uh, to acknowledge his contribution as well to my thinking and what we're talking about uh, here today. As you can see, this is uh, my talk is on what I call psychologies otherwise, uh, decolonial approach to our present crises and I want to uh, share uh, my thoughts about this and uh, so let's get started and I will uh, try to speak uh, slowly and carefully so that everyone can hear and understand. Um, this paper and uh, two uh, in progress articles emerged from my concern really kind of my alarm in regard to the emergent links among climate change, massive biodiversity loss and the uh, health inequities that arise from social inequalities. In my view, these problems, both individually and collectively, pose an existential threat to social, political, and biological systems, both currently and with increasing impact over the next half century and beyond. And it's now clear that these crises are connected. For example, the processes driving carbon emissions and mass extinction are related to the vast accumulation of wealth by an increasingly powerful global elite. And given that behavioral, political, and economic processes are direct, directly implicated and imbricated in these crises, how can we understand what's going on and shape a cogent and compelling response, perhaps even a life-affirming response? And while my uh, the basis of my analyses is historical. I also apply this, as Ernst said, to a very contemporary and even a future uh, problem and possibilities. Of course, for many of us, uh, just uh, almost anywhere in the world now, the coronavirus pandemic has dominated our screen time, perhaps our thoughts, perhaps our fears over the last few months, and we don't know how it will end or even if it will end. It is, if you will, our crisis of the moment. Yet it is not the deepest of the crises that we are facing and may well be only one symptom, even of a very frightening one, a much, a much deeper and broader array of the linked crisis, crises of climate, biodiversity loss, and the social inequalities that are well underway and have been underway. 
these uh, crises are running constantly and ominously with variable visibility, sometimes in the background, sometimes in the foreground, but they're always there. They make me, they, they give me the same feeling that I found, if you know the, uh, the trilogy uh, by Jeff Vandermeer, the Southern Reach trilogy, the aura, the creepy aura generated by Area X in these environmental kind of horror fiction um, novels that he wrote, I recommend them to you. But, but you're actually probably experiencing that same creepiness uh, just with what's going on in the world today in regard to the pandemic. So in, in this talk, then I'm going to just offer a brief sketch of these crises, probably more about uh, the climate crises than the other two, and uh, give some sense of uh, how they're linked. Um, then I'll offer um, a, a way to approach them, kind of to de-link from, if you will, the, uh, the everyday uh, understanding and uh, think differently about it, to think perhaps about a psychology's otherwise approach. And, uh, you know, uh, it's always important to ask, how did we arrive here? Kind of that's the historical question. And certainly a full history is well beyond the scope of it. Once any one scholar and even a, even a brief overview is really uh, more than we have time for today. But I'll, I'll offer a brief sketch. We can look to the last 500 plus years, um, and which saw, to give the big picture, the rise and eventual hegemony of the of Eurocentrism and the its offspring of kind of Euro-Americanism. Uh, the hegemony and its social imaginary depend on a set of dualisms, uh, man, uh, uh, nature, culture, us, them, mind, body, man, woman. And especially the last uh, speaks to the critical role of patriarchy and reductionism in science and, and especially speaks, I think, to our ecological catastrophe. And while I can only touch on these complexities, I, I will be examining them and so many people, other people are too, um, in, uh, in both the printed literature and online talks. So this is part of my larger project of searching for knowledges and praxis otherwise, that is in addition to the Western Enlightenment model of rationality in the hopes of creating a pluriversal approach to finding and creating viable futures. Psychologies otherwise, I hope, will be a contribution to such a pluriverse. I use here a, a photograph taken by my friend, and, uh, Jillian, and uh, with her permission, use it that climate chaos is here. Now, I'll leave it up for just a moment uh, while I introduce this section on the climate crisis. The Australian feminist and philosopher Val Plumwood argues that our ecological crises uh, is a result of what the dominant or hegemonic rationality has made of enlightenment or culture has made of enlightenment rationality. Such rationality, as I think you know, privileges the masculine, identifies nature as female to be exploited and subordinated, reifies the autonomous individual and makes invisible and without agency members of marginalized groups and other than human animals. At the heart of this rationality, if it has a heart, is a complete blindness to our ecological embeddedness. The, the social hierarchies regnant in our rationality in the, in the, from the Enlightenment be, certainly began with the establishment of human settlement for agriculture and the instantiation of patriarchy and the inequities that arose there and that have continued that diminished then the matriarchal or egalitarian approaches or cultures that were there present as well and created the foundation and then the ongoing support for extractivist and exploitative practices on the earth. When European modernity began, it brought with it new horrors of domination and exploitation of both of peoples and of the earth. And there again, I find myself making that same kind of distinction between the earth or nature and, and humans and which, you know, it's kind of a rethinking of that. And so it's, as you'll hear, I've drawn upon the work of people like Walter Mignolo and the modernity coloniality group, especially Mignolo's work uh, on the darker side of Western modernity his book with Catherine Shaw on decoloniality, where they argued that modernity actually began and is defined by the coloniality of that established by the Spanish and, Spanish and Portuguese voyages of exploration and colonization. And this 
I'll, with that then, when as capitalism emerged, it solidified the commitment to androcentrism, exploitative and extractive practices, and the othering of non-male, non-white, and non-European or European descent populations. So the history of the climate crisis, past, present, and future is linked to capitalism. In the last third of the 20th century, and continuing until the current moment, uh, now with a decidedly fascist and nationalist bent, much of the world's political economy underwent a shift from a state-centered regulatory framework to a neoliberal orientation that continues to the present. And that impact has impacted our politics, policy, and sociality, and has profoundly contributed to our ecological crisis. It offers solutions for such a crisis, such as what we read about or hear about in the proposed Green New Deal. But if we look closely at most Green New Deal proposals, they're really rooted in a neoliberal focus on the responsibilized self and narrow forms of environmental action centered on the individual and greener consumption choices. And I think, I'm not sure that is, uh, well, I am sure that that is no solution at all. Now, just a tiny bit of data to set this, uh, to, to propel this forward. Around the time that we think of industrial capitalism, beginning in the mid 18th century in 1750s um, of our current era, scientists today estimate that the carbon dioxide in the uh, uh, particles in the atmosphere were 277 parts per million. A week ago today, when I last looked, um, on May 19th, the daily carbon uh, dioxide uh, particulates in the air reached 416.85 parts per million. And these scientists say that if we do nothing, then by the year 2100, we will have 800 plus parts per million of carbon dioxide and a temperature that has risen four degrees Celsius compared to 2011. And human activity accounts for almost all of the rise. Capitalism and its accompanying emphasis on the autonomous individual with a private psychological self has been not only an economic model, but the infrastructure for a social and political imaginary that simply says this is what's normal and expected. And the history of capitalism is, is rich and it's complex and it's worth investigating. It's certainly, we could, we could say, argue along with Sven Beckert in his book, Empire of Cotton, that it began in the field and not in the factory. But certainly uh, uh, the basis that laid down by the early development of empire built around trade and, and the exploitation of, uh, of other populations, uh, laid the groundwork for even then for what gets counted as human and who is fully human. So that those who were, who were not white, not European, not male, especially non-white females to use the European gender binary that was unknown in many parts of the world were all valued only for their labor. And that was primarily, at least at the beginning, uh, slave labor. And so, Capitalism then is built on a foundation of extreme violence in the service of profit. <clears throat> and over time, what industrial capitalism has done and continues to do is employ extreme violence on the earth itself in a mode of extraction and exploitation. And we should not fool ourselves that capitalism does not employ, <coughs> excuse me, brutal physical violence on exploitable peoples and exploitable species. It has, it does, and it plans to continue to do so. Those species that cannot be exploited are, are of no use and, and utterly expendable. Now, along with this is an a, a, a emphasis on limitless growth, consumption, um, and our concepts of freedom uh, in liberal societies are predicated on that, that free to consume, uh, that that's our purpose here in the world. And developmental policies, which don't have time to go into. The whole development notion um, is uh, really, if you want to know more about that, I recommend Arturo Escobar's book, Encountering Development, both the original in 1995 and the 2012 edition, as well as Gilbert, Gilbert Rist, uh, Exhaustive History, History of Development. Thus, as a result, our climate crisis or catastrophe uh, or chaos, the earth is something separate. The dualisms developed and employed to justify hegemonic rationality, man, nature, woman, man, etc., depend upon the earth being something other, not us. Now, I want to uh, move just briefly 
and, and offer a, a much briefer um, account of biodiversity or just overview of biodiversity. Here's a picture of a monarch butterfly actually taken on, on, uh, in, uh, on, uh, in my yard last summer uh, at the end of the season. The current climate crisis and human activity has already had a major impact on biodiversity. The possible and probable increase in pollution and human in intrusion on wildlife habitats means it's not tenable for survival of millions of species. And, re and that uh, is, represents a major threat to human health. The implications of this for food security alone are so sobering, if not frightening. Some states, nations have taken action, such as Germany, to protect insects, while in others, such as in, in Mexico, people who tend the, uh, the, actually, if we will, the home habitat of monarch butterflies, two of those workers have been murdered recently. And to use just one example, well, one of the most disheartening human environmental impacts is on, on marine diversity, and that's the, the, the plastic trash that's being dumped in the ocean. It's increased tenfold since 1980, affecting at least 267 species, including 86% of marine turtles and so forth. The 2019 report of the, of the IPBES, which is a UN-affiliated organization, states clearly that current policies of practices will not mitigate nor lessen the impact on biodiversity and all the implications that has for human societies, including food security and health. Now I'll move to my last overview and uh, once again share a screen. This is a, a slide taken in Quito, Ecuador, Ecuador last year, the protests over what has been of the social inequalities that were there in terms of the economic impact on, on the population. So I wanna talk a little bit about social inequality and health inequities. Uh, climate health and equity are, are tightly linked and I'm gonna focus on the health part of, of um, the social inequities. Um, Historically, there is substantial evidence of associations between climate and health and climate and disease, especially infectious diseases. And historically, it has been marginalized populations who've suffered the most from pandemics and other disease outbreaks. And as we all know, marginalized populations have contributed the least to the climate crisis and yet are already suffering the most. Whatever, whatever lines along social lines or economic or political lines that we want to parse this on, whether we're talking about gender or age, ethnicity, religion, ability, or class, in reality, they all intersect and overlap. And inequalities are mutually re reinforcing the relationship between income and wealth and health, for example, and educational opportunities. Um, and I, I refer you again, though I suspect you already know it, uh, the work of Pickett and Wilkinson, the two epidemiologists on income inequality and health. And research is solid on the, the drivers behind climate injustice and health inequities are fundamentally the same. They're based in social inequalities and inequities, their institutional power held by a decreasing number of elites, and the fact that we need to change, uh, make broad changes in our health systems and infrastructure social, uh, so, social support. In the United States, States, one of the probably where there is the greatest disparity between income and, and uh, uh, health. Uh, we've clearly seen the disproportional impact of the coronavirus on individuals and communities of color. The challenge may be due to heat, food insecurity. Let me just stop this and go back to, to myself here. Um, or the lack of healthcare facilities. A very recent Harvard study showed a strong link between air pollution, respiratory disease, and, the, and death from COVID-19. Um, when we consider our present crises, then the pandemic, the crises of climate change, biodiversity, loss, and social inequality, of which the current crisis is an expression, what do we hope for? Is our thought or hope that we will overcome these crises and return to some kind of normalcy? return to the neoliberal imaginary or some variant of it, where the 1% or the 0.05% have more and more, including protection from the threat of viral pandemics. Well, a, a really, um, I think, effective depiction of this is, can be found in the uh, two of uh, William Gibson's recent novels, 
the linked novels, Peripheral and Legacy, I recommend those to you. Um, what are we in the social sciences and psychology to do? Business as usual, go on being critical and hoping that somehow the next generation will find a way to deal with the crises we've helped create. I hope not because I think that there, there are alternatives. This is an image uh, uh, it's taken May 5th, 2020, uh, on the looking west from where I live. It had snowed that day, and the sunset behind the snow, it looks like something to me out of a science fiction movie or something, but I use it to, to begin to talk about moving in a different direction uh, to a psychology's otherwise, a decolonial approach. And, but first, let me just super briefly uh, articulate a difference between a decolonial turn and decolonization. First, decolonization is aimed at states, at institutions of the state, at what is instantiated. Thus, Tuck and uh, Wang's argument that decolonization is not a metaphor, if you know that article. In our case, the institutions are universities, journals, disciplines, and professional societies that we belong to. In decolonization, and those efforts are desired to replace or supplant uh, or at least gain recognition from those institutions. A decolonial approach, however, does not focus on states, institutions, or that which is instantiated physically, but to, to borrow from Mignolo and Walsh, it means to change the terms of the conversation, the assumptions, the rules, the principles, to practice, if you will, uh, epistemic disobedience, what I call thinking otherwise. And as I, I get to this last part, I want to make a brief quote from my friend Sunil Bhatia, whose recent book on decolonizing psychology is, is well worth reading. And uh, while he was writing about something slightly different than what I'm talking about, I think his example is cogent here. One reason, I quote, one reason why we do not have detailed intellectual and social histories of indigenous psychology is because it's often been considered as deeply rooted in local practices and relegated to the realm of the mythological, the, the cultural, the collective, the religious, the traditional, the irrational, the primitive, and so forth. But of course, psychology, hegemonic psychology, is seen as moving from such a basis, the cultural, the primitive, the individual, et cetera, to the scientific, to the universal. And somehow or another, it has to then be grounded or rooted or localized in the brain. And it's that, Bhatia argues, and I, I think most of us know this argument, that's what determines how psychological knowledge is created, the methods it generates the message, the methods. So going back to my own language now, a decolonization approach to psychology is predicated upon working within established institutional and academic frameworks to make psychology more inclusive of points of view, of peoples, et cetera. I have no argument with that. It doesn't change much, but it, uh, it is it's certainly worth doing. A decolonial strategy makes it possible to de-link from the dominant academic, academic and institutional frame to think otherwise about what psychology means and what psychology can be in terms not constrained by global North sensibilities. And in doing so, it opens up different possibilities for us in terms of how we think about and do psychology. So what do I mean by psychologies otherwise? First, I'll say what it's not. I'm not arguing for a totalizing psychology. Uh, intended to repl replace or somehow supplant institutional hegemonic psychology as it is now. Rather, I'm thinking of the Zapatista notion of the pluriverse, where many worlds are possible. And the pluriverse contrasts with what the ST scholar, STS scholar John Law calls the one world world, or OWW. It might be easier to say the initials than to get my tongue tangled up on one world world. By this, uh, uh, John Law means the Euro-US centric primarily hegemonic view that reason is what is defined or articulated in one tradition or imaginary. It's dualistic as noted above, then the world then can only be what the one world world or says that it is. And the Euro-US centric approach is masculinist, it's patriarchal, it defines modernity, rationality and epistemology, that is what those things are. It's ontological, 
uh, ensemble, to use Arturo Escobar's term, is consists of the autonomous individual, objective reality that is prior to and independent of the practices that produce it, a belief in science that makes alternatives, such as indigenous and local knowledge, and, um, and that makes that invisible, is what I meant to say, makes invisible alternative uh, approaches uh, to this, kind of, this science. This is the one world world. It's based Based on dualisms, nature is static, man is dominant. Now, so psychology is otherwise. Um, let me, uh, as my last photograph, and then I'll go back to, uh, to myself, a picture of myself, is a picture from Ecuador of the Andes, because I want to use an example from there. Beautiful photograph. Um, so for a possible alternative, I move to how we can think and feel with nature. That is to practice a psychologies otherwise. One thing of several that deeply troubles me when I read reports of these various governmental agencies is that, uh, and reports in the scientific literature, psychology, psychological and otherwise, is that nature is always depicted as something out there. It's something that is not us. When I read, and I find that, as I say, in psychology as well. Um, so what I want to argue for is a new cosmology, or if that goes too far, a new ontology, that we are, that we are not separate from nature, not other, not stewards, not caretakers, not exempt. Instead, we, we create a psychology that embraces a relational ontology that will allow us to develop a psychology otherwise that will then makes it possible to think and feel with the earth. It would be a will be a psychology, and I think it's underway, uh, that is regenerative, that draws on what on a variety of sources um, that are based on relational ontologies. It may use epistemologies that are fuzzy, to use Bernd Reiter's uh, uh, term in his recent article in the Journal of Theory and Social Behavior. For movements such as eco-materialism in the arts, um, uh, you know, I was introduced to that by my friend and a leader of eco-materialism, uh, Linda Weintraub. It's drawn from and based on a recognition of being part of the earth, not separate from it, not a steward of it, but a learner being educated by the rhythm cycles of the earth. It's symbiotic like mycelium with trees and plants. It's a psychology based on the cooperation modeled in such symbiosis and not only on the competition model of evolution. Um, I refer you to Weiss and Buchanan's recent book, The Mermaid's Tale, Four Billion Years in the Making of Living Things, where they argue from developmental biology and ecology that cooperation and not, not competition is the norm, um, is the key to understanding life and that on the proximate level, Cooperation is fundamentally more the norm and more important than competition. The work of the primatologists, Charles Snowden, a noted primatologist on cooperative behavior among primates supports this as well. Snowden wrote that humans are super cooperators. It is cooperation rather than competition, he says, that makes humans special. Now, I don't want to slide back here into a one world world approach that says, well, this is the only psychology then. Um, I'm, Again, not wanting to supplant hegemonic psychology, but to offer an alternative, an otherwise, if you will. And, and one final example there, the microbiome in each one of us, where there is like literally more in us that is not us than what we typically think of us. Um, and the existence of that microbiome and the absolute key to our ability to survive means that we really can't, that we cannot exist apart from other. Uh, I love the title of Gilbert Sapp and Talbert's article in the Quarterly Review of Biology. Um, I, I, it says it best, we have never been individuals. But what about mentality? Because this is what psychology has been concerned, concerned with. I use this word rather than psychology, though I know psychology has been and is about more than mentality. How can we delink de from the narrowness of hegemonic psychology? This is a step then toward a decolonial approach. I remind you of Bhatia's language about indigenous psychology is deeply rooted in local practices and relegated to the realm of the mythological, collective, religious, et cetera. In other words, those labels I just referred, primitive and so forth, means it doesn't fit within the one world world of hegemonic psychology. It's not modern, it is other. And, it, and so um, 
th this is considered primitive and not acceptable psychology. But I want to give an example, and it, it may seem far out to you, but I'm going to give it. In Marisol de la Cadena's book, uh, Earth Beings, Ecologies of Practice Across the and Andean Worlds, uh, she's a Peruvian anthropologist and her work in eth ethnography is in the Peruvian Andes. And she recounts some of the ethnography she's done with, uh, with this uh, uh, Mariano and Nazario Turpo and their Ayu, the group, if you will, they identify with, which includes other than human animals. It includes the, the plants. It includes the stones. It includes the mountains as all part. That's what finds the being. Um, and she recounts a story uh, from, Nazo from Mariano, who was uh, a leader of this particular group, um, and uh, his son, where he, she was talking with them, and uh, a plane had crashed on the Apu, which is the chief mountain, uh, as part of this, this being, this Ayu, that they were part of as well. And Mariano said that, the, that Apu had not been happy or pleased with the violations of the earth, and so the plane crashed. De La Cadena said, oh, you believe that mountains, the Apu, have feelings and responses to those feelings. And Mariano said, no, belief has nothing to do with it. So that brings up then the question of sentience. And I, and I want to kind of bring this to a close here with something brief. I use this example to suggest that mentality or, sen or sentience is a property that extends beyond humans. And it has great implications for how we then experience ourselves as part of the earth and then the relationship to the environment, to social inequalities, to biodiversity. I would suggest that sentience is a property that extends beyond humans. What if we choose to practice the affirmation of the sentience of all beings or even the earth itself as a living ecosystem not only for how we understand consciousness as a profusely distributed, distributed property of all beings, but also for how the world from the earth to our bodies to ourselves is ceaselessly co-created by flows of energy and material. And then take the next step to say that all entities are mutually constituted and that the key here is to practice interdependence and not just theorize about it. So I close then with a few questions. Can we make the decolonial move to de-link from a rather narrow embrace of what psychology is as defined in the canon that we were educated in? <clears throat> Can we engage in ontological disobedience or perhaps even onto-epistemic disobedience to think and feel with the earth as part of the earth, as one kind of being among many other than human beings to embrace a psychologies otherwise? Human existence on the earth may depend on some such. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wei. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, now we can, uh, I can open the uh, space for discussion and I would like uh, to invite you to <clears throat> write, your, write your questions in the question answer this uh, tool down on your screen and I will read your questions. Uh, wait, you don't have to do that. I will read the questions and I will take Okay, okay. all right, thank you. And um, I want to start with the question. Um, first, I want to thank you again for your talk. This was very interesting and I agree with many things you are saying, especially that we have to think ourselves embedded in our relationships with, right. say, with the world. So, and um, in a way, I have two questions. Okay. So, uh, my, my first question, actually, you are, you are starting that you are saying the problem uh, 500 years ago was a turn that we see is disembedded, that the embeddedness in of human life uh, uh, that we don't consider that anymore. So, and now you are arguing that's exactly what you what we have to do, or for what you are arguing. So, my question is first: Why was there such a colonial turn? So, uh, the colonial turn. Mm -hmm. So, and then you are arguing mm -hmm. for a decolonial turn. However, mm -hmm. you understand me? Is it uh, yeah. is the yes. connection bad? 
No, okay. So no, uh, well, it was for a moment. It was for a moment. Uh -huh. Okay. So uh, my first question is: Why was a colonial um, strategy, a disembedded, isolating strategy, also in psychology, so successful? And then you are arguing for a decolonial strategy in turn. So, and here my question is, on what kind of resources within psychology or history, in the history of psychology we can build on? There are some lines in the history of psychology where our forefathers were exactly arguing beginning of the past century. Uh, William Stern, for example, in Germany, reading uh, 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 biologists, so we realize we humans are connected with nature, social, yes. cultural, and more, and during the last 20, 30 years, more and more psycholog psychological approaches emerges, trying to understand us in our embeddedness with mm -hmm. the world, which we are part of creating. So my question is, where are here important lines or maybe even some important concepts we can build on for such a plural, pluriversal, um, uh -huh. Right, you. right. Um, I, I, well, I, I would say that certainly within what we think of as disciplinary psychology, which is what I think you're referring to, is what are the lines or historically within disciplinary? What is what we call disciplinary psychology? Yeah. Which, of course, as we we all know, is you know kind of multifaceted. There are many threads there. Hegemonic psychology, especially, is that which we see today is is really a reductionistic model. Uh, but there have always been non-reductionistic psychologies. Uh, the late uh, kind of US um, psychologist uh, Sigmund Koch talked about uh, psychologies in the plural, uh, which I remember being really influenced by my, uh, when I was younger. Um, so I think there are some threads. I, could, I can see some things in uh, uh, even uh, looking back into the, uh, uh, the Gestalt movement, or the the era of out of which Gestalt psychology arose, as being one of those threads, because it it asked us to think more broadly or to think more completely um, about the context that we are part of. Um, so uh, I think that's one. Um, so. I also think that there has been some work at the interface uh, at times, uh, this is not, I mean, this is not, uh, it's not that widespread, but I think there is, there was some early, some mid 20th century work at the interface of psychology and cultural anthropology that you began to see some of those possibilities as well. Because of course, anthropology underwent a terrific change, not that it's, again, uh, there are many expressions of anthropology uh, then and now, but I think of the work of people like Marilyn Strathern, uh, like that, who've been working in the field for many years, who really now are part of this kind of pluriversal approach uh, coming from anthropology. So I think we, we can look in psychology at a few threads, but Ernst, what I would say as well, and what, what I'm really interested in too, is how can we draw, what if we simply extend the sense of what it is that is psychology? and not just rely only on disciplinary approaches. It made it challenges us to think that way uh, because you know, a discipline is about uh, like any other, if you will, institution um, is something that protects itself. That is, it protects its space, the intellectual space. It protects its, its uh, if you will, its livelihood and that there are jobs uh, there are departments and all. And you know, it's the old saw of, uh, again, the disciplinary uh, uh, view that we all have uh, is that discipline is an intellectual division of labor that's just as much part of capitalism as uh, you know, the division of labor in a, in a factory. Uh, we're just in a different kind of factory. And that really constrains our imagination about, because we want to, I mean, it's not that we individually are doing this, but that we grow up just saying we kind of protect the boundaries of what, what we're at. So I think that's a limitation. We're willing to uh, uh, Dil Tai's work, for example, I think is relevant here. Um, oh, and I'm blocking on his name. Thomas Teo recently wrote an article about him in the uh, in an issue of a journal, a special issue of a journal, a German uh, 
kind of philosophical psychologist. Oh, I'm on a block. I'm sorry, I'm blocking on his name now. I refer to uh, the issue of theory and psychology of fall 2018, Thomas Teo's article there. I don't, I don't have it right in front of me. So I think uh, not to just go on and on and answer to, uh, to drag out an answer here, but I think there are some sources that if we search carefully, we don't have to, we don't have to abandon the, the past, if you will. I think your work on everyday psychology is also a, a real resource for people. And I, I know you're not the only one doing that. Um, some of the work coming out of, uh, out of New Zealand, um, uh, both by Maori psychologists, uh, as well as um, uh, people of European descent there, I, I really find uh, some real inspiration in that work. It doesn't get a lot of play uh, in Europe and in the US or in, in North America. Uh, but if one looks, you can find some really good things there. Uh, there's also some work by uh, um, uh, folks in Australia. Uh, more recently, I was recently, I hate, I hate to say this, but um, my own commitment to not keep expanding my carbon footprint, but I recently was in Hawaii. This was before the, um, the pandemic. I have an older friend who was ill and I wanted to go see him. He's older and uh, so I went and uh, his, his wife is Hawaiian, native Hawaiian. I met through her, I met a number of people uh, who are native Hawaiian and really it began quite a conversation that is ongoing with them about notions of, uh, of, um, of humans as part of nature there, that it's a very much a Hawaiian perspective. So I think there are sources like that as well. Uh, so yeah. I'll, maybe I'll just stop my answer there. Yeah. There are also more and more uh, questions coming in, uh, and I will select some for you. Um, um, I, uh, I start with Xiomara Valentina. Thank you, Wade, for this great presentation. How would the alternative perspective, seeing ourselves as being one with nature, which by the way is practiced by indigenous cultures, fit into the current, uh, current scientific practice of attempting to reduce concepts to figures and data? Mm -hmm. I don't think it fits very well, just to be honest. I mean, it's just not a fit, um, which may mean that it calls on us to change rather than to say that, well, sorry, it doesn't fit, so we're not gonna go that way. Um, uh, because that's the kind of practice that, I mean, in some ways, I didn't say it directly like this in my talk, but I think uh, many people uh, have said it in some way. Um, that is really the issue and what a, a, a hegemon does, right? It's like, it excludes. It says, okay, that doesn't count. And so I think this is what it's calling on us to think, to think otherwise, um, to take a, to really, it's, the burden is on us us, in my view, uh, to, uh, to, to see what does this mean to think and feel with the earth. Um, so I'm, I'm going to close the window because somebody's working outside here. <laughs> sorry. Okay, sorry about that. These, these are informal days. Yeah. That's fine. More and more questions are coming in, and I try to choose them we have enough time so i will take all of them but uh, uh, i try to connect them in the okay thank uh, you um and there's one from says up uh upon upon thanks wait for your presentation i would like you to clarify the difference between the decolonial turn and decolonization practice with within social science would you also comment on the major trends in indigenous psychology with, with respect to Africa and Asia? Good, good question. Good. That's, a, that's really a good question. Um, the, uh, so, uh, you know, I just made that brief introduction in, the, uh, in, my, in my talk about diff trying to differentiate between decolonization efforts and, and, uh, and decolonial approaches. And my own orientation starting about I don't know, 15, 16 years ago, I only really thought of the decolonization part because I, at that time I was working more on trying to understand indigenous psychologies and what does that mean? And um, well, it turns out that one of the articles I'm writing has to do with the history of indigenous psychology in terms of 
I won't go into it. That's another talk. But anyway, so it's quite interesting because my, my thinking has changed so much over the 15 years because I've been, I feel like I've been educated by reading, experiencing different things. Um, so, but decolonization, I, I think, uh, I remember being shocked when I first read Eve Tuck, uh, Tuck and Wang's article, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. Uh, Eve Tuck is a, um, again, uh, I do not remember which group that she is a member of in terms of uh, native groups uh, in, um, in North America. But uh, she links decolonization. She says it always has to be about something, about something that's instantiated. And for her, it's, it's land. Because for in indigenous peoples in North America, and I think many places, there is no separation between the person and the land. I mean, it's not a matter of ownership. It is a matter of this is us and, and that's us and we are that. And, and uh, so decolonization then has to address that return of the land, not in the sense of ownership, but in the sense of the right to it. Um, and that really got me thinking because I had not been there. I thought it was sort of decolonizing our thinking about it, which of course will happen. Uh, uh, but it got me thinking about uh, the, both the strength and the limitation of decolonization efforts. Uh, not that I think we should abandon it. I think Sunil Bhatia's book on decolonizing psychology is well worth reading. Um, and we should in pursue those. But I think to make that distinction, what, what, what indigenous psychologies, when I read that literature, uh, the people who are the, the, uh, most, the foremost advocates for indigenous psychologies, often are simply are wanting to change the discipline or, or at least add to the discipline that this approach that in Chinese societies, for example, these characteristics are psychological characteristics that are, if you will, part of Chinese psychology, completely legitimate. I'm not calling any of that into question, but it doesn't fundamentally change psychology to do that. It just simply adds to it. It's like, okay, at least recognize that as Chinese we think this way, or we, but you know, a really great example, and I should have mentioned this to your earlier question, but I think it, it illustrates this point or it comes into play here too. One of the first, if you will, in I'll use the term indigenous psychologies that I encountered some years ago, maybe 18 or so years ago, though it had already been underway for quite a while, was work in the Philippines. Um, and uh, Virgilio in in and his, and, uh, his, his colleagues, uh, unfortunately he died at a relatively young age, even in, by the late 1970s and into the 80s, they were developing really different methodologies for how knowledge is made based upon uh, at least that, you know, the culture of the island, the main island that they were on um, in the Philippines, but there are thousands of islands there and many different approaches to things, but, but where they were. And I'm really struck by what uh, uh, Enriquez and his colleagues were doing there. And a few of them still, there's still a movement there of, of um, Filipino psychology. Uh, and I really had hopes for that, that, you know, when I started reading it, wow, there is really an alternative. But one of the things that Enriquez and his group did then, and, I, and I'm not sure if it's changed now, so I don't want to speak to where, to where, whether it's different, is they still wanted to see this as a somehow another a uh, forming a universal psychology, and 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 that's fine. But that still falls under that one world world approach in my, my view. Uh, so that's what decolonization lead us to. Is it still the one? We're still in some ways accepting those strictures, and I wonder if we could not in fact not just the psychologies otherwise that I mentioned, because I'm really, of course, feeling uh, very connected to the earth, but there are other things too. I'm not trying to make a, a new one world world with that. So decoloniality then is about thinking differently. It's about, you know, the assumption, it's uh, the, that uh, what Mignolo calls epistemic disobedience, but I would say also ontological disobedience as well as the terms of what is the real, if you will. So. I won't go on um, and I'm happy to correspond. You can share my email with people. I'm happy to correspond via email, send them a copy of the talk or other things I'm working on. I'm not trying to, um, I'm not trying to reserve this just to myself. I'm hoping to get it out there as well. So I'm glad to be part of this. Yeah, but uh, wait, there's still some question. <laughs> so, we, and we still have- Okay, good. 
Yeah, yeah, there are more. There are more and more and more coming in. Uh, um, and I take one which connects to what you uh, we are just about what you are just talking. It's from Gordana Jovanovic. Oh, I know Gordana. Yes, hello. <laughs> Nice to see you, she's writing, at least virtually. I would like to share your hopes, but to be honest, I'm quite pessimistic. The colonial turn you argue for means to, have in, to leave institutions which were built also as achievements of historical social struggles. To take just an example of university, to th those who have appropriated and perverted those institutions. Probably my doubts come from my own perspective. I feel the university has been taken away from me. I know how difficult it is to change even a curriculum, but to give up would be, in my understanding, a kind of epistemic and even moral injustice. Would, what would you say on my thoughts? Oh. I always love to hear from Cordana. She is um, a great thinker and I've learned so much. And we generally, though we may start out in different places, end up in very similar places in terms of our thinking. And I wouldn't disagree here. Um, I, and I don't want to sound as though I'm advocating for people who have jobs in, in the academy to give up their jobs and work on something else that's outside the academy, not at all. I think we can work, if you will, to decolonize even from within and, and make a, find a place for those voices. I think of all the fine critical psychologists like Thomas Teo and many others um, who in fact have, have created a space. So your own work, Ernst, in everyday psychology or Michelle Fine's work and her, she and her team at the, City University, at the grad school at City University of New York. That absolutely important to have those kinds of outposts. And I see them really as, as just that. Outposts. They're like, well, maybe I should you turn use different language. Maybe they're signposts to, to the future rather than outposts. Right now they're outposts to help to help all of us survive intellectually in the neoliberal environment of the academy today worldwide. I mean, I think those are absolutely critical places. Um, but I think they are also potentially signposts uh, to the future. But I do think that as a signpost to the future, that partly what that signpost is pointing towards is that we need to expand the range of what we think of as possible as psychology. That, it, you know, I'm not, and I, again, I'm not suggesting anyone give up their job, any of that, uh, but I am suggesting that we think more broadly. And, and with Gordana, I, I, I'm with her in that I'm not going to give up the, the uh, trying to address my colleagues in psychology, right? But I'm, I may be addressing them with some information or some perspectives that aren't drawn from hegemonic psychology. And I think there are, there are so many people doing fine work and some of you who are listening and Ernst, you may know the really excellent work of Glenn Adams at the University of Kansas, who is on the outside, looks like just a traditional kind of social cultural psychologist, but his work is like gets right at the heart of what this whole kind of modernity coloniality has done to us in terms of how we think of ourselves uh, in the world. And it, it's actually quite radical though. I mean, when you first start reading it, you think you're just reading a typical social, cultural, psychological article. And then it's just like this, it just turns you around uh, with what he's, what he's actually writing about and saying. So absolutely we need that. But let me, let me just sound, and this is, I'll just go out on a limb here. Uh, and say, I am not sure. Uh, now, I'm, I'm 67 years old, so, uh, and I'm in good health and knock on wood, and I hope to live a long time, all of those kinds of things. But I, I won't live forever. But uh, I'm not sure that the things as we know them now, you and I, um, are going to continue for, for all that much longer. And so what I'm really thinking of is how can we create what I call small C communities of resilience, whether it's intellectual communities, or other physical communities even, but certainly connections among people and places. And so I, you know, I'm also trying to think ahead 50 years, 75 years. I you know it sounds odd, I'm a historian, but I'm actually thinking of what this implies for the future. I mean, the situation that we are in and, and not only in North America and Europe, but in much of the world now. Um, and so we may need a psychology that really at a, uh, well, I do believe we need a psychology that, that learns to think and feel with the earth. 
maybe just for sheer survival. So I'll stop there. So Gordana, I don't think that we should shut down and leave departments. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks, Wade. Um, another question is from Paul Kroche. Uh, I applaud your psychology otherwise. It bears some relation to ideas in process psychology. This, oh. this outlook involves not only ontological rebellion, but also a professional one, as your response to the previous question also underlines. As an established figure in professional psychology, what advice can you provide for junior figures who may find themselves, as Babette Babich and others have pointed out, threatened by taking on such perspectives? Yes, that's, that's really, um, that's, that's, that's a super good question. Um, Having, all, having been myself a junior academic and then, you know, um, it's a tough one because sometimes you speak out or you write and um, the, um, you know, there's a price sometimes to pay for that. And I wouldn't, I, I, I'm just not in, a, I'm not in a place to say people ought to, ought to do something that's going to threaten their ability to feed themselves or, or their families or, or maintain their health or, or anything. Um, but I do think that there is a price, a, if you will, and I use this term very advisedly, there is a spiritual price that we pay when we don't follow what we feel and know to be true within ourselves, um, as part, whether we think of ourselves as part of the earth or not. Um, and that diminishment of life, when we sacrifice our, the, the truth, the core of who we are, I'm not sure that that's worth it. Um, um, but maybe, maybe it's easy for me to say that because I'm at the end of a career, right? I've already stopped working for institutions and I'm an independent scholar. So it's easy for me to say. But this is where Ernst, and, and, and thanks so much for that question. Um, and I'd love to correspond with this person as well, if, uh, uh, if they're willing. The, um, maybe, maybe this is where we form community, small C communities of resilience. And I use resilience in a very, uh, in a term that's not at all like what the mainstream uses it. It to me is a community property. It is not about the individual. And uh, so that we support each other. Um, people will lose their jobs. Um, I think uh, coming out of this pandemic in many countries, there will be people who will simply be axed because there are not enough students. That's certainly going to be the case in the United States. Um, and I don't know about Europe. Uh, so yeah. the, uh, I think we have to form these communities uh, that are forming even through conferences like this, where we make connection with people, like the connection I made with you when we met in New York a few years ago. Uh, I mean, now I know that I can go to, to your work for sustenance, intellectual and otherwise, you know, uh, and uh, that's, that's kind of, I think we're going to need that more and more. So I won't go on and on about it. Thanks for the question. Yeah. I want to take another question from Svanima Bargava. Okay. She's writing, I wonder about the link between technocracy and how unmourning it is. Uh, unmooring it can be to dis distance us even further from our local context. Yeah. yeah. I think we tend to see development as linear and, and your idea of thinking with the earth may be seen by some as a move backward. What alternatives do you suggest that can make it possible for young psychologists to hold space for, alter for alternati alterna uh, alternates to emerge? Oh, good question. Good question. I think the question of uh, technology is really an important one. Uh, and I have, um, um, I've always been skeptical of relying too much on technology, yet I do every day. Um, and uh, in some ways, it is a privilege, even those of us who have, you know, internet platforms, and uh, we connect easily through wireless. And, and the fact that we're doing this technologically, I mean, I think this is fabulous. And just think of the reduction of the carbon footprint on the earth and all of us did not travel to Paris to give these talks. I mean, that's a blessing in a lot of ways uh, to have that. On the other hand, it would, I love meeting people in person. I just, I, I like to see the person up close that I'm talking with and so forth. 
But that's a good question about technology. And I was skeptical uh, more so than I am now. So past tense, skeptical. What I'm beginning to see is that technology can also be used to bring people together. Uh, it, takes a, it takes a commitment to honesty. Uh, by this, I mean a kind of existential honesty that this is a representation of me that you're seeing, that it's mediated by you know, the fact that there's a camera on my tech, uh, technology, the camera on my computer, the internet, uh, the fact that Ernst invited me and is in a place where he can also connect in this way. Um, but I do think technology, if we're, if we're honest, um, and willing to be um, who we are, who we are um, I think that, that we can overcome some of the barriers of the kind of uh, isolation that technology brings. Um, I'll leave it there, but I, I think it's possible. I don't think we have to abandon technology. Uh, it may, I, I don't know the future of it, but I, I think that at some point uh, we, we, we have to learn to thrive with it, but not become utterly dependent on it. Um, mm -hmm. So, and, and we can strengthen our connections even that way. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that there. That's a, that's a really good question though. It really makes me, I've thought about this quite a bit in the last, really since this pandemic, I've thought about the reliance on technology and uh, both it's good things and, it's, and, it's, and the parts that aren't so good. Yeah. Maybe let's take two more questions. And um, one is relating to, techno to technology. It's from Alfonso Williams. Uh, if we hypothesize that, uh, that a decolonial psychological effort was successful, and it, can you understand me? Do I yes, speak? I do, I do. I'm listening quite carefully. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, if a decolonial psychological effort was successful and integrates a multiplicity of perspectives satisfac satisfactorily, also if we assume that, in a post-decolonial psychology, how would we tackle the challenges of inco incorporating artificial intelligence technologies that mediate these perspectives? Wow. For example, we have the ability to make avatars and profiles that allow us to be not ourselves and others. How would we integrate these behaviors at the, simula at, at the, at the simulated level? Wow. wow. I have to say very honestly, uh, I have never thought of that. I don't even know how to respond to that. I think it is an excellent question. Uh, I think this, uh, I think artificial intelligence, I, I think the, the, the person may also be referring to machine intelligence more broadly there too, uh, which I find quite scary the little bit I know about it. Um, but I'd really like to learn from this person about it. I, I truly don't know. Uh, it's a great question. I, I, have, I have no real response to it. Um, I'll, I'll just leave it there. I'd like to learn more, please tell me. Yeah. So uh, let's take our final question uh, from uh, Mark Freeman. I'm very sympathetic uh, to the idea of crafting a more inclusive, capacious psychology and view of what science is. I also still find myself inclined to help reimagine and reconstruct the discipline of psychology. But more and more, I wonder whether a kind whether a kind of succession is called for and the formation not of another discipline, but something else, more plural, organic, trans or supra or post-disciplinary thoughts. Oh yeah, I, I mean, I, that's, um, that's well said. Great question, Mark, thank you much. Um, yeah, uh, I, certainly, I, as I said, I'm not interested in creating another hegemonic psychology. That's not my point but rather to argue for a pluriversal approach, which is, I mean, there's, there, there's a world in which many worlds fit, if you use the Zapatista notion there. Um, I, I mean, I, I want to just qualify one thing here. Um, I think some of the viewers may have known or may know that uh, Thomas Teo and I co-edit the review of general psychology. And uh, we've, we're now in our first full year as masthead editors. And one of our aims is to bring into the discussion and bring into the journal work drawn from 
what we psychological humanities as well, as innate disciplines even. So I don't think of psychology as just a science. Uh, in fact, its deeper roots are in what we now call the humanities rather than the sciences. Um, and so in that sense, I would agree with Mark is that there is a way if we're, if those of us who are working now and um, who can create the kind of openness and, and widen the parameters of what psychology can be, I think there's room, I mean, in some ways we can use that route moving toward a pluriversal approach. Um, so rather than say, no, I wouldn't go with that, I would say, yes, let, let's do that. I mean, I would encourage, I think some of Mark's work is, is really, is, is made us, helped us think really differently um, about psychology. So, I, and I think, it, I think that that is something that we want to keep encouraging as well. But ultimately, I think that we, that because of the crises, it isn't just it isn't just a matter. And I think this is a good last question because I, this may be the last thing I say. I cannot stress enough, um, and I don't think I'm 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 uh, speaking to people who really disagree with me here. I cannot stress enough that we are in a crisis. Um, this is not just bad times. I mean, the pandemic is terrible and it is a crisis in and of itself. But the climate catastrophe that we are part of already, it does not have a good future. And I see so few people actually taking it seriously. Um, you know, I've participated in Extinction Rebellion work um, and uh, I think that's great, but it's not enough either. Um, and so I just, I, I'm not willing to just sit back and say that, well, you know, we're gonna write better articles and those kinds of, yes, we should do all of those things. Um, but we, at some point, we really have to be willing, I think, to be radical here uh, and to say something different, um, not just for the sake of difference, but for the sake of the earth um, and this, for the sake of the future. Uh, and so thank you, Mark. Thank you to all the people who asked questions, even the ones I didn't uh, get to hear. Uh, Ernst, I don't know if there's a mechanism in this to share emails. I'm happy to respond to people via email. Um, and, uh, you know, one way, the one that's used with this is my journal email, rgpwade at gmail.com. Uh, and I'd be happy to have a correspondence to even do Zoom with people, whatever. Um, but these are critical times. I think this is a great conference to bring up some of the things I've watched on here it really made me think differently. So I really appreciate being invited, being a part of it and all the people who've listened in. Thank you very much Ernst for your, your help as well. Thank you Wade uh, for your talk and uh, for sharing your thoughts, which are so important. Um, there, and I also want to thank for the participants uh, for participating and for all the good questions. Um, they, we have a Slack um, system, so where you could join, but maybe that's too complicated now. Maybe I will explain you later. Okay. Uh, where we can exchange uh, thoughts and continue to exchange. Okay, good. I, good. I, 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 will, um, I will try to explain it to you so people can share after the talk now and okay. we can discuss further on. Okay. I just want to say we uh, the day of the conference is not finished. Okay. <laughs> we have one talk after the next really so interesting talks. <laughs> we have three three more sessions today. Mark Freeman, Hank Stam, and Hartem Rassian. Oh, so good. At seven o'clock, nine o'clock, and eleven. So the conference is continuing. Good. Thanks very much, Wade, Thank for you. being with us. Thank you.